good day everyone welcome to this episode of generally irritable this one unlike most episodes is pre-recorded instead of live but would love for you guys to still engage in the chat make sure if you have any questions for our guests or comments anything to add go ahead put it down in the comments and before you do anything else make sure to like this video share this video and subscribe or follow on whatever platform you're watching. Remember that you can find Generally Irritable on Rumble, Instagram, YouTube, all of the socials everywhere. You can find our presence. And uh, yeah, so that's that's the little housekeeping that we got going on today. Uh, today I've got a really interesting guest. His name is Robert Chernin. And he's the chairman of ASIC, or the American Center for Education and Knowledge. It's a think tank that is working on educating Americans on uh, important issues. And, and I'm going to, I don't want to say too much. I want to let Robert talk about it a little bit. Um, because when, you know, the one thing that I, that I saw right away when I was introduced to Robert is the passion that he has for America, for this country, and and really for his community. Um, we've talked a lot about, about China and the encroachment on uh, the United States sovereignty. We've talked about education and school choice. And no matter what the topic is, you can tell he really, really cares. And, you know, these are the kind of folks that we need uh, to be to be leading the charge, to be a leading conservative voice. Um, and, you know, I say that even though Robert and I haven't agreed on anything. But I can tell you one thing. We agree on a lot. We agree on the importance of the Constitution, on, on constitutional rights and duties. And we agree that it is our responsibility to be self-governing. And, and that's the thing. I, I just love his passion. I love how much he cares about this country. And I don't know if we can get him to pull out one of his katana blades while we're on the podcast today, but I'm going to try. Okay, you guys, I'm going to try. I've gotten to see him work with it. He's a black belt. It's pretty, he's, he's, he's smart and he's a badass. Okay. So anyway, without further ado, uh, Robert, thank you so much for joining us on Generally Irritable today. Hi, Erica. Thanks for having me on. And, you know, we're related, you and I. So you're generally mm -hmm. irritable and I'm generally irreverent. I think I think <laughs> that makes us cousins. The two IRR words together, I exactly. think. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. Gen irreverently generally irritable. We might have to do we might have to do a, a joint podcast sometime. <laughs> uh, anytime. Anytime. I'm game. All right. Awesome. 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 So, so Robert, tell the viewers, what does it mean to be the chairman of ASIC? Like what, what is your, your drive? What drives you to, to help, you know, push and support and educate about conservative values? That's a pretty wide open question. Let me, let me answer it first this way. So we have lost our center as a country. Right. The country was founded on certain beliefs. If you go back and you start in the beginning, you know, when the country was first founded, it's not a common ancestry. It's not a common ethnic group. It is a common set of beliefs and values. And we've gotten away from those beliefs and values. What are those values? Very simply, right? Personal responsibility, individual liberties, small government or self-governing, as you said in, in your introduction, and that the power of government or the consent of the governed is required for those who govern us. We have gotten so far away from that, we can't even decide how many genders there are or sexes there are. Last I checked biologically, there are two. And no, it's not a choice. <laughs> that is one of the things, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm already getting off of the rails here, Robert. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't mean to, to light you up. I apologize. No, no, it is. It's one of those things like it. Wait, but it's it's not. A, you said the thing, right? It's not a choice, but then it is a choice. If it's if it, if your gender can both be fluid. Right. But also you don't have a choice about it. And so if you're a bigot, if you say that there's only two genders, I don't. How can both of those things be true at one time? Well, they're not quite quite simply. 
I mean, you have to understand that what we're fighting against is what I would call a new religion, right? Religion is based on faith. As an yep. example, in the 60s, man landed on the moon. We launched a rocket. We landed on the moon, planted a flag. Neil Armstrong landed on the moon. How do you know? Were you there? Was I no. there? So there are mm. certain things you take on faith, right? That's the greatest true. of faith is what do you, and faith always precedes the fact, right? Because if it doesn't precede the fact, and if it's after the fact, it's not faith, it's hindsight. The greatest faith is belief in God uh, or, or an almighty creator, right? Okay, well, yeah. if, if you believe in that, which I certainly do, then there are certain things that flow from that. What you have on the other side is what I would call a revolutionary movement that is trying to eradicate those structures of belief, those common set of beliefs that we all used to agree on. And we can go down the rabbit hole on that a whole lot, but there's really, there's more than two genders. Well, Someone this has is, to prove that to me. It's not a choice. That's one of the things that is so, the, you know, comparing it to the religion, right? So if, but if you, if you have a religion, let's say, right? Judeo-Christian values, let's just say, because mm -hmm. that's the most common that we're accustomed to, right? That means a certain set of things, right? Like if I'm a Christian, it means I believe in the sanctity of life. It means that I believe you should honor your mother and father, even if they're buttholes. Like it says that like <laughs> the only the only one of the Ten Commandments that has a promise, uh, you know, and because it's going to be the hardest. Um, let's see. You got to, you know, don't steal. Right. So there's a set of beliefs and we have a book. We have books that say these are what the rules are, but they don't have that. Everything is subjective of how you feel and it can change from day to day. So right. how can you have a country or a philosophy with no mooring like that? Well, you, re you really can't, right? I mean, right now, I believe it was Michael Savage who used to say borders, language, culture, right? So we have borders. We don't have a common language. And we don't have a common culture at this point. So what is it that we believe in? But let me get back to what you were talking about in, in the beginning was passion for ASIC, why I'm doing this. I've been involved in politics in various aspects for 30 years now. And this is the most important battle of my lifetime because it's about the world that I'm going to leave my children. It's not about me anymore. It's about yeah. us. It's about the country. It's about a common set of beliefs. And it's really simple. One of my teachers years ago, you talked about black belt and all that stuff. And that's probably a different conversation for a different podcast. But used to say, look, Chernin, look for what you have in common. Look for those seed concepts. Those seed concepts are those things that we believe, right? Freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, all the, all the rights that are enumerated in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, the Bill of Rights, right? yeah. Right. So, and we've lost that constitutional grounding because remember something, before we are a democracy, and we're really not a democracy, we're a constitutional republic, but before we're even a constitutional republic, Erica, we're a nation of laws. Laws are the last line of defense, if you will, the rules, if you will, of a civil society. So when you hear people like Black Lives Matter or other social justice warrior organizations, which to me is just an oxymoron, if you know, it's a jumbo shrimp if there ever was one, but that's again, <laughs> a, a different discussion. When you hear about these organizations who want to uh, defund the police, what they're really saying is, we want to get rid of those people who enforce the laws, right? Law enforcement enforces the laws. And we don't want these laws because with any revolutionary movement, you have to replace that which came before you. Get rid of all the statues. Get rid of all the cultural items. So if you can now, and by the way, once you've broken <laughs> down man's laws, right? Yeah. Let's eradicate then laws because we're going to defund the police. Once you've broken down man's laws, then, then you, you can break down God's laws. laws. Yep. And when you go after God's laws, that's when you're saying, well, there aren't one man, uh, two biological genders. There's incredible number of genders because it's a choice. That's just total crap. And anyone who I think is a reasonable, rational person, whether you're right of center or left of center, I don't care. When almost in, Unless you are a zealot and you have a mission, this progressive mission to make America, to transform America into something different, thank you, President Obama, there's only two genders. And anyone who's reasonable, because those are God's laws, by the way. There are two yeah. genders. 
They're not three. They're not five. They're not 12. It's not a personal choice. I, it's, oh, almost like, it, it's almost like we've gotten too polite in our society. Like, like we got so polite in America that, and we said, well, we just, we just want everybody to be okay. Right. The argument is, well, we don't want anyone to feel like they're out, you know, out, out on in the out group. We don't want anybody's feelings to be hurt. We want inclusion, you know, all this stuff. And on a surface level, that sounds good, right? You don't want, you want people to feel included and a part of, we know that human beings need to be in community. We, that is a need that we have, but, but then it's, but it morphed into then you also have to accept unacceptable behavior. You have to accept things that are not are not okay. Generally speaking, you have to be willing to put you know women and girls at risk for the sake of this minority of people. And so it's almost like I feel like we got too polite for our own good. We got so polite that this this weirdness could creep in. I would. Do you think it, it was that, or do you think it comes from somewhere else? So I would phrase it differently. I know what you're talking about and I think you're onto something, but it's not that we're too polite. It's that we've allowed political correctness to silence one side of the debate. One of the things that, you sh that you'll notice that I'm sure you do is the other side so defined. And we can talk about what the other side really is or isn't. But the, the people that are pushing this sort of social, progressive, transformative agenda in America Actually, they used political correctness to silence any dissenting opinions. Even so much if you go into academia, right? What did they have? They have yeah. safe spaces, microaggressions. No. Well, let's have a safe space where you can't say anything again that's bad because you're going to hurt my feelings. And again, you know, you're obviously a lot younger than I am. At least you look a lot younger than me. But when I grew up, there was a saying that said sticks and stones will break my bones, but yeah. names will never hurt me. If you think about what that really means, I mean, think about it. It's a trite saying, but what it yeah. means is what I think about myself is more yeah. important than what you think about me. And we've inverted that. Now it doesn't matter what I think about myself because I may have low self-esteem or, you know, um, I have other issues because my parents didn't love me or whatever my insecurities right. are. Now it's up to you to not offend me. Yes. We've inverted that. We've inverted it through safe spaces. And by the way, the you know what the ultimate safe space is? Take a guess. What's the ultimate safe space? Um, my house. Academia and tenure. Oh. Right? People who cannot make it in outside in the real world, right? The, re the real world is the land where you only get to eat what you kill. And I don't mean that in a, in a, um, in a um, aggressive sense. It's just Look, life yeah, is just, you got you got to fight for for things, and you, you don't know, work, you, you don't eat. Right? Yeah, you that you we say, the way we right. say is you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah, you don't work, you don't eat. So what happens? We have this thing called tenure. So people who can't make it out in the real world are in academia, and this has happened over time. And look, we've taken our eye off the ball. We've lost control of our cultural institutions, whether it's whether it's um, the media, whether it's Hollywood, but it starts with academia. Right. I mean, look, yeah. Hitler went after the youth movement for a reason. The youth are most impressionable. Right? Yeah. And if you want to move a generation, get them when they're young. So these people, let's call them the hippies of the 60s. Yeah. Who couldn't really make it in the real world. So they went into academia. They were protected by tenure, the ultimate safe space. And who doesn't want to have safe space? How could you be against a safe space? We all want to be safe, don't we? But that's a yeah. canard in that safe space where they can't be fired. Right, because I'm about a meritocracy. I honestly, I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're black, you're white, you're red, you're pink, you're fat, you're thin, you're gay, you're straight. I don't care. I want the best person for the job. Yeah. Right? I don't care the color yes. of your skin, right? Martin Luther King. I don't care yeah. the color of your skin. I care the content of your character. Period. End of discussion. But not in academia. So it started in academia, that safe space. So it's not politeness, like you were talking about, which I think you're being frankly, too polite about how you're discussing <laughs> it um, because it's about safe spaces. Look, academia used to be a cauldron of ideas where well, then, you would have people battling out on ideas and arguments yes. and, debates, and that's healthy. 
I'm good I with mean, that. I mean, that's what it was like bring, when I was in school. Bring it, bring it on. If you can't survive, but you see, that's the problem with the progressive left or the social justice movement, transformative movement. They don't want debate. They yeah. want obedience. They want to it's silence insane. dissent Words because they can What? I said, words are violence. Uh, you know, you oh. can't question me or it's the end of the world. It's like, right, right. why though? And then there's microaggressions. Well, you said oh this, God. but this is what you really meant. So wait, mm -hmm. now you're inside me and you know my intentions? <laughs> you know, That's okay, my there, favorite. And I'm um, like, yo, you never have to worry about microaggressions with me. I am all <laughs> the way out aggressive. You will know right. if I like you or not or don't like you. It is like... People, microaggressions is a thing that got made up so that people who want to be offended can find a way to be offended at literally anything. You know the sad part to me about microaggression? The sad part Tell to me. me is in real terms, I used to love going to comedy clubs. When's oh, the last God. time you went to a comedy club and there was something funny? Because if you can't laugh at yourself, yeah, right? I mean, life is very serious. I'm very serious most of the time, but I love to laugh. I can't remember the last time because now you're making fun of someone or you're transphobic or you're, I forget the term they now use. There's another term they use that you're, or you're, I don't know, misogynistic or you're, um, <laughs> no, no, right. No, what is it? it, it it's you're appropriating, appropriating, right? What's the term they use? They oh use my God. Some, oh, I'm sorry. Cultural appropriation. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. That's my new favorite term, right? So oh, you're yeah. like, you, so you can't laugh at anyone or anything because it'll nope. hurt their feelings. You know, when you my, can only when my punch down or punch up. Right. So when my kids were growing up, I remember they used to play soccer. We, I remember taking them to a soccer game where they played soccer without a ball. You want to know why they played soccer without a ball? Because, because, because if anyone scored a goal, it would make the other side feel bad about themselves. Oh my God. Oh my God. And, Robert, and you don't want them to feel bad. about. I, I mean, I pulled my kids out. I'm like, are you kidding me? You are not. I don't even believe you. That did That's not right. happen. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, excuse me. Um, you forget the liberal state I used to live in. <laughs> I think you know. Uh, by the way, I think you know that state. Oh my god! Yeah, but that is like, that is like, I can't. But then, why are you even playing soccer? Go do something else. Well, look, we, we have devolved into a culture. And look, this comes oh, back Lord. to why are we doing what we're doing with American exceptionalism? And why are we trying to sort of rebalance and recenter America on the fundamental principles upon which we were founded? Because if 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 there are no winners and losers anymore, right? Because yeah. we don't want to hurt their feelings and there are no winners and losers. We're so far away from what this country was founded on. And look, the truth is, most people would say that I'm a Republican. Really? I'm a libertarian. I want the government mm. to do a couple things for me. Other than that, leave me alone. Yeah. Right? I, yep. I'm, I don't want the government to give me fish. I would prefer the government to give me a fishing pole and let me catch my own fish. Just get out of my that, way. Right? Just and get that self-dependent, that rugged individualism, that independence, that's what this country was founded on. And yes, by the way, there's one thing I didn't add and I should really add. It's very important. So, so the okay. three things that we're fighting for is number one a code of personal responsibility that no one's you know we're a victim society no one's responsible for anything anymore it's everyone else's fault that's crap number two yeah. the individual liberties as enumerated by the bill of rights but number three is also important looking out for your neighbor not telling him what to do or her what to do but sense of community and looking out for and caring about your community. We used to do that through our religious institutions. And one of the biggest differences now is the progressive transformative left wants the, the state or the federal government to do that. They want the nanny state. Mm. You think about it. Remember at the height of COVID? What happened yep. at the height of COVID? At the height of COVID, they made you scared so you'd stay in your house. They yep. made you reliant on the internet You and they prevented right of assembly and that, right? So you couldn't get together in your bars yep. or your restaurants or your church or your, wherever it is you, yep. you would assemble with friends and community. You had, you were isolated in your house and then we're going to now control what you see on the internet. I mean, think about it, right? Those three yeah. things, individual uh, was, liberties, personal was, responsibility and, and looking out for your neighbor. It's not really much more complicated than that. 
That's American Center for Education and Knowledge. And we're doing it outside the system. We're doing it outside the system because the system, look, I have plenty of friends who are Republicans. They're good people. But this change needs to come from outside the system and it needs to come from the grassroots, not from the politicians. Yeah, I I 100 percent agree with you about that, Robert. I think that it's it's because Americans have moved away from being self-governing and taking responsibility for their country and for the for running it for their neighbors for their family you know we were just talking with uh some family earlier in the week about this you know in other as for, for example in other countries generations of a family live together in one household you have one house it'll be the grandparents the parents and the kids maybe the grandkids depending on what's going on and here it's like no, we don't we don't want our old people around. We're going to put them in a home or we're going to make the state take care of them instead of having them in our house with us and like figuring it out. And I just think it's so strange that we've come to this place where we've said, um, you know, government, it's your responsibility to take care of the widows and orphans. So here's my couple of tax dollars. Thanks. And I'm going to go over here and do my little thing. You know, like well, the government does not have the capacity to care for people or love them or heal them, you know, and this idea that somehow it can solve all of the world's problems or make things better is so misguided. Like what, where in history do these people have evidence that the government can make things better? You're assuming they want evidence. Um, um, evidence is facts, right? Yeah. Where's the evidence? They don't want facts. This, well, this yeah. is about feelings. This is about <laughs> their faith. Look, this whole wokeism <laughs> is a new religion. Wokeism is religion. That's what this is. This is a new religion Period. and it's an intolerant one. Facts have nothing to do with it. Well, and I guess that's the thing is we don't, it doesn't even matter if this is realistic. It doesn't matter if it's never happened in world history. We are, we're different and special and somehow we can make it. So is it arrogance? Is um, it? I, 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 it's ideology know? to me. I, I, I don't think it's arrogance. I think it's, I, I think it's idea. Well, maybe it's a little arrogance, right? Because who's pushing this movement? Mostly upper middle class, college educated, um, frankly, frankly, white people, right? Upper upper edu- middle class educated. It's not solely, you know. A, I mean, they accuse the the conservatives of white supremacy, you know, white supremacy. But most of what's pushing this whole liberal, progressive, transformative movement are the are the upper yes. middle class from academia who think they know better. So there probably is some arrogance to this, but I think it's deeper than oh that. God. I think it's an ideology. I think what you're really oh talking God. about, you, and are you ready for the word? Here's the word, socialism, right? The minute you say the word socialism, people roll their eyes and they think that it's some mythical threat that, that went away when Stalin died in the Soviet Union. <laughs> That's what they think, right? Stalin died, oh you, know, the, you know, as opposed to Khrushchev, who was at the UN, took off his shoe and was banging it on the table. Right. Who said that yeah. we're going to we are going to feed it to you. slow. I'm paraphrasing who basically said Nikita Khrushchev said we're going to feed it to you slowly. So over generations, you don't even know what's happening. And that's basically what this is. This was accelerated by, by the election of Barack Obama because he was so telegenic. He's such a, a smart individual. But if you've ever read Rules for Radicals, which if I'm allowed to turn around on that bookshelf behind me, I have my copy. I can read you oh, chapter yeah, first. Go for it. That's what's going on. You're going you to make me find it, right? So, <laughs> I mean, I that, Robert, right? that's one of those books that we tell everybody they need to read. If you want to be involved in politics, if you are, if you are right of center, you have to read this book. You have to understand right. the methods that these people are using to fight you. Right. Know your enemy. This is your enemy. This is mein Kampf for the progressive, transformative social justice movement. 
It is called Rules for Radicals. It's basically what they're doing to us, and yep. we're too dumb to know any better. So is it arrogance, perhaps? But I think it's really ideology. And yeah. anyone who's read that book, it's a very easy book to read. You'll read it in a day. Um, you can't not read that. You, if you read the book, you, you will see the light differently as to what's yeah. going on. It's a decentralized well, is, movement, but it's an intolerant religion. That's what this is. Yeah. And that's what ASIC is well, fighting against. One of the things that I thought was so strange, particularly, is whenever I talk to a person who is a leftist, um, I we had a, a fella renting a room from us who was a card-carrying communist, like a Stalin apologist. Okay. And uh, I'm not even kidding. He was like, it wasn't all Stalin's fault. I was like, yo, dude, I don't know about that but um so when i talk to these folks right and and we're we're having debates and we're and we're working through it and we get to these certain points and i say okay but you you say the government but you also admit that human beings can't be trusted and that we're corruptible so you want a bigger government in charge of more stuff and more things in your life even though you acknowledge that human beings are problematic and corruptible so how do you solve the human nature problem. That's how I that's how I pose the question. I say, how do you solve the problem of human nature in a socialist system? And nary a one has been able to answer me. But you're appealing to them using logic. Oh, logic dang has it, nothing to, logic has nothing to do with it. This is religion. You're arguing <sighs> oh against the religion. Oh my God! It's like it's like arguing with a with a zealot. It does not matter. Is that what it is? It's like these are just such zealots that they will not be reasonable. Well, the the Soviet Union had a term. It's now called Russia, by the way, but it used to be the Soviet Union when I was growing up. Had a term called useful idiots. Mm. Most of the people in the social justice movement are useful idiots. They mean yeah. well, but they're just misguided. And they don't, the facts don't really matter. But the people who are sort of driving this, let's call it the George Soros's of the world, you know, the World Economic Forum and, and China for sure. We haven't talked about China. I hope we have a chance to do that because China yeah. is public enemy number one for sure. But most of the people pushing this are well intentioned. Of course, these are the same people who are so far away from their survival skills that they now get food delivered to them. They don't even have to cook the food. They get it delivered and they can push a button in a machine and now you get your food. I mean, you want to talk about when an EMP comes over the country and all the electricity really? goes? Um, who, they won't even know how to light the stove. Right? They're getting their food delivered for them. I Forget wouldn't see what was the getting their food delivered for the record. Right. <laughs> Forget about killing your own food or, 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 or whatever, you know, living off the land. We're not even talking about that. We're talking about these people don't even know how to cook in their own home anymore because it's too much of a time waste and you can spend all your time enjoying life. Enjoying life what? The government provides everything for you, so therefore you can just sit around and do what? See, I was raised that life is a wonderful thing. This is a great country, but you got to work for things. No one's going to hand you anything. And frankly, nobody cares about your dirty laundry. Work hard. Don't complain. You know, and try to do the right thing, you know, most of the time, as you know it, and try to take care of those yeah. around you. It's not really that complicated. Yeah. Just don't be a butthole. That's what I like to say. Try not to be a butthole. Are we allowed to say that on the air? You can say butthole. Oh, I've been, watch I've been watching my language because, you know, your producer said I had to be watch, you know, because I do have the truck driver mouth. But <laughs> I have you and me both. So I just I try not to swear. Butthole is usually about the worst thing I say on air, which I guess technically is still pretty bad. It just doesn't sound as bad when you take the cuss word out. So I might have to reconsider that. Robert. Well, you know, I, I, I go back to George Carlin and the seven words you can't say on TV. Right. So mm. um, I mean, butthole doesn't quite come to that level, but. I'm just, I'm learning where the boundaries are, Erica. So I just, yes. you know. Well, I mean, my, you know what? You know, speaking of boundaries, that's a great segue because we're seeing a blending of boundaries between the United States and China, right? We're seeing 
uh, the one of the number one of the largest landowners in the country is China. They're buying up food processing plants and farmland. Smithfield, Food, Smithfield Foods. They bought the largest pork producer in the country. They own uh, BlackRock, IBM, Lenovo. Um, I got one for you. Why would China want? And by the way, let's be clear. In this country, at least there used to be, there's private business and then public, right? Public would be either publicly right. traded companies or the government. In China, those don't exist, that separation, that wall of separation. All corporations are either directly or indirectly owned by or controlled by the Chinese government, right? The, yeah, the, the name People's Republic of China is a myth. It's not the People's Republic. It's the China, it's the CCP. Right, the Chinese Communist Party. But in this country, right. right, why would why would China want to own AMC movie theaters, which they do? Propaganda? Two reasons. They want to control what you hear and more importantly, what you don't hear. Oh right? uh, yeah. Mes messaging. Messaging. Yep. Um, it's pretty clear that even now with a weakened <laughs> military, China does not want to and will not. Um, have an open war with us. Why should they bother? They can beat us from within. We're, and that's what they're doing. And that whole, yeah. spy, can we talk about the spy balloon for a second? Oh my God. Oh my God, Robert. When I, okay, I can't, I am, I'm beside myself about this. Okay. When I heard, when I heard that a, a Chinese spy balloon made it from Alaska to Montana before it was shot down. Yeah. Uh, what what well, is well, there, happening? There were, to there were two spy balloons. One was over South Carolina, where our where our nuclear bases are. But actually, <gasps> the truth is, I I feel I felt really bad because when I first heard that the balloons were shot out of the sky, I said, you know, Dorothy is never going to make it back to Kansas anymore. Oh, so because that's what I figured. I mean, I figured if there was a balloon in the sky that was a threat, we would have shot that down. We wouldn't have waited a week to shoot it down and have this, them this clean all this. Saying sensitive data. So I thought it was Dorothy, you know, with the red shoes, just, you know, you know, say a moment of silence because Dorothy and Toto are not making it to Kansas anymore. Because you figure out, they, come north, they come back over Montana and then they float down to Kansas. Made sense to me. Are we, hold on, are spy balloons manned? I assumed they were like drones or something. No, they're unmanned. They're unmanned. Okay. They're unmanned. Um. So what, I mean, if that's not an act of aggression, what is? Um, how many flights has China flown over Taiwan with their nuclear bombers in the last year? In massive oh, numbers. A lot. So that a lot. it's okay for China to penetrate Taiwanese airspace. It's now okay for China to penetrate U.S. airspace. It took the Biden administration a week to shoot down the balloons. That's outrageous. That's the Biden administration. Again, we then get into the whole China Joe Biden um, administration, and I'm and I'm going to be nice about all this. But if you go back and you look at the Penn Center for the Global Affairs and Diplomacy, that received how many millions and millions of dollars from un from um, anonymous donors from China, which is the Joe Biden Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I mean, this is like the... And then there just happened to be some classified documents laying around? Laying around. Well, just, well, you know, he was, you know, he was he was tired of making airplanes and ran out of paper, so he needed more paper to make new airplanes. <laughs> I just, it, you, you, this is one of those times where you go, okay, it, this, what is it? Is it Hamlin's razor? No, Occam's razor. Don't attribute to Occam's. malice. No, Hamlin's Occam's. razor. It like... The, what don't attribute to malice that which you can uh, attribute to stupidity but when you see a pattern of behavior when we see the corruption with the sun when we see all the donations and the relationships i mean if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck i don't what do you it's usually a duck you you think we're stupid like to me what they're saying is we think the american people are either too stupid or too distracted to care. It's pretty simple. Follow the money. It's not that hard. 
Follow, yeah. follow the money. And I don't think America, the, the average American is too stupid or, or, or too busy to care. I think that's one of the th reasons that we, we have the economic issues we do. Keep mm. the average American, keep the middle class, right? Because that's what that's really where their fear is. The fear is a middle class yep. uprising against yep. against the government. And I don't mean taking up arms and storming the, you know, storming the, the capital like January 6th, you know, storming the Bastille in France, right? That's not what I'm saying. But what they're worried about is the middle class, sort of the disaffected voters, right? Those voters, mm -hmm. I mean, you saw it in, in, in Britain with uh, Brexit. You saw it with the Trump voters. You saw it in Brazil, right? Those disaffected voters, that populist movement, which comes from the middle class, keep them busy, yeah. keep them taxed, keep them down. That way they can't participate in government because they're too busy just looking after their family or they're too busy just trying to make ends meet. Keep them busy. That's well, and you know what? And therefore, there are no. Let me finish one thing, if you don't mind. Yeah. One yeah. other thing that goes along with that is the cacophony of noise that comes out of the media. Yep. How do you, so? How do you decide? So I'm too busy living my life anyways because I'm just you know I'm 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 in the gig economy or I'm on an hourly wage and I'm trying to make ends meet, and then there's all this noise in the media and I'm going to what spend the time to figure out where the truth decide is. When where I don't know where my next meal is coming from or I'm living yep. paycheck to paycheck doesn't happen. Well, and that's one of the things that I find so fascinating is that Democrats and Republicans used to agree on that being a problem. Elizabeth Warren, of all people, wrote a book called The Two Income Trap about about the the expected consequences of the rat race of both parents being in the workforce. So, so this was something that people understood a long time ago and I feel like it's almost like a lot of this is just further erosion of our culture of societal bonds, which makes us weaker and easier to manipulate and turn politically. I would think you, I think you are correct. Oh, good golly. Um, so what would you say, like, if you, if you got to be emperor turning tomorrow, let's just say, <laughs> And you could write any rules for dealing with China that you wanted to. What, how would you, like, what are the first things that you would do to address it? What do you think we should do as a country? Uh, what the government, the feds should do to uh, address the China threat? Well, I think you really have to do three things um, and you have to do them at the same time. You have to prevent foreign ownership of U.S. corporations and U.S. land. You have to repatriate production or manufacturing that we have sent over to China uh, or, or we mm. have uh, gone overseas with mostly to China, but certainly in other parts of the world as well. And then you have to uh, eliminate things like the Confucius Institute and the the flood of Chinese students who come here and go and then go back there and to China. So there's an educational component, there's an economic component com combined with real estate, and then there's a manufacturing component all of which are being used against us. And let's not forget that the theft of technology or the theft of personal data, whether it's TikTok or Lenovo or GoPro mm. or the, all these corporations where all this data is being sucked over to China for use against us. And frankly, we're too stupid to know any better. Uh, by the way, the Department of Defense in 2000, I want to say 2019, I think it is, came out with a report that's, that cited what's called COTS, right? Commercial um, off the shelf software and, and technology that, that we buy that's controlled by China. And while I think the federal government on some level has gotten that right a little bit, all the state governments still have all this technology they buy from companies that are owned either directly or indirectly by China. And where do you think all that data is going to? This is one of the things that has been sort of hard for me to get my mind around because you know the TikTok thing makes sense to me, right? right. Um, it's a it's a it's an app that collects a bunch of data, you know. Okay, but I didn't know about what's the Lenovo thing. So I will send you. And that's a, so um, is that so, a computer? That's a computer, right? Don't they make computer like laptops? Well, Len Lenovo bought IBM. Right. So Lenovo is a Chinese company, 
right? It's controlled indirectly by the Chinese government. And there's plenty of websites you can go on uh, and okay. look. So this is not this is not Robert making this up or being uh, incendiary <laughs> or hysterical or a worse yet a conspiracy theorist. Right, go down that rabbit hole. You know, I'm late for a very important date. Sorry, wrong rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> sorry, the irreverent part is starting to come out as we do this a little bit. <laughs> That's good. So, so if you look at all the investments, if you will, that China has made in this country and all the things that they control within technology, in farmland, in, in media, in finance, in finance, BlackRock Financial, right? I mean, so what China is trying to do under the one world order. So the 20th century was really considered the American century and China is clearly vying for hegemony in the 21st mm -hmm. century. And the American model was exported during the 20th century, that of democracy. And we can talk at some other time as to whether or not we really should ever been in the business of exporting democracy. I am of the opinion we shouldn't mind your own business, but that's a different conversation. But clearly China in the 21st century is looking to project their uh, model of government on the rest of the world. Don't forget, remember they wanted what? COVID passports run through the WHO, yep. administered by whom? China. Yep. It goes well, on and, and on and on. And that was one of the, um, it's, it's like all of these world leaders are coming out praising China for the way that they've done things, saying things like, oh, well, isn't it great that they have a dictatorship so they could just force everybody to comply? When I heard right. Justin Trudeau say that, I was like, what? Uh, but, you know, it's not just him. You're hearing world leaders, you know, the World Health Organization and all these people be like, China's great. China does it right. And I'm like, China forcibly sterilizes people, enslaves people, and makes you kill your babies if they're the wrong sex. That's I don't correct. know that we should be, I don't know that we should be extolling the virtues of a country like that. Look, this goes back to 1996. And the reason that's relevant is actually 1995. If, if you're old enough to remember, the uh, Clinton president, the Clinton presidency and yeah. Johnny Wong, the Buddhist temple and all the fundraisers where money started to come in from Asia, specifically China. After that election, by the way, there's a huge um, investigation done by the, I want to say, I think it was the House, might have been, no, it was, I think it was the Senate. And I forget the name of it, basically concluded that there was foreign influence and money in that election, but they couldn't prove it beyond a shadow of a doubt, right? And you know how Washington is with that kind of thing. Yeah. What did China get? They got exactly what they wanted. They got entry into the World Health, uh, the um, World Economic Council, right? Mm. They got accepted into the into the nations, right? Because they were isolated the up until that. United Nations. Was that when they were accepted into the United Nations? No, no, not the UN. The, no, they, they got into the... Um, World Economic Forum. Wow. Right. So they started getting access. They started getting started access. And then what did they do? They used their money to gain more and more influence and access. The, uh, people should look at the Southern Hemisphere and the inroads, right, that China has made in Africa, in South America. Right. I mean, those are the things. Yeah. So it started, it started, of course, with the Clintons which is a whole other conversation. Oh, um, good golly, Robert. Right. We could right. probably have a whole podcast just on the Clintons. We could have a series of podcasts on the Clintons, frankly. <laughs> uh, but that, but look, it's not, it's not without, uh, it's not a surprise that the Clinton, what is it? The global, the Clinton global initiative or whatever they called that was getting yeah. how much money every year when they thought that she was going to be president in the minute that it became obvious that she was not going to get elected. Guess what oh. happened to the money? Dried all the way up. Dried up. So Biden Inc., as I like to refer to the Biden crime family. Um, <laughs> am I allowed to say that? Um, you definitely Biden Inc. Are. has taken what the sure that's what they, they are. And they have exponentially expanded the um, the pishkesh or the um, fragrant grease in terms of the money coming to mm. the Biden family at large. I'm not saying yeah. that the president is corrupt. I have, no, I have no idea. I will tell you if the stories about Hunter Biden are true and seems to me other people have proven it, he clearly is corrupt. 
And yeah. I guess you could make the argument, well, it doesn't rise to the level of the president. I, smarter people than me are going to have to figure that one out. I'm not law enforcement. I'm not FBI, but I am fairly well read. And it would seem to me that China, whether it's through the Biden administration, whether it's through different initiatives and it's the the Confucius Institute or the Penn Biden Center or buying out Holly, you know, Hollywood or, or the MBA. They don't buy out the MBA, but obviously, you know, obviously the MBA derives money from what broadcasting. In I China. mean, they they can get people to take down tweets and you can right. get LeBron James to shame people. And right. to, so, so they free money. words, follow the money. This isn't yep. rocket science. Follow the money. It's and what you say? Walks like a duck, money. talks like a duck. It's usually a duck. Quack, quack. Exactly. So if, it, again, uh, following along the Emperor Chernin line, which I'm telling you, when I when I saw the video with um, the katana, I was like, I was I was feeling the Emperor Chernin thing is all I'm saying. <laughs> I think you could make it work. Watashi wa hatamoto. This is what I'm saying, okay? So if we've been talking a lot about education and i think that you're right you know when we see what's going on in the educational system um when we see you know as an example that the government is funding uh secondary education uh saddling generations of young people with debt doing all of these things do you think we should start with like with with primary education changes like in the in the high schools, elementary schools, do you think we should start at the college level? Like where, where do you want to kind of, where do you think we should attack first? K to six. Okay. Did you notice how I paused before answering that? I know that's why I was like, that was not what I was expecting you to say. And you said it so fast. Um, so what, why that demographic? Because I think we've already lost a generation or two or three. And I think it's going to take a full generation. You have people now who, who believe that socialism is an acceptable form of economic uh, operating model. And they don't understand the, the social um, things that go along with that and the control. I mean, look, if you go, you know, people think that politics is a linear spectrum, right? The right is all the way over here and the left is over here. But it's not a line. It's a circle. Yeah. Politics is a circle. If you go too far right, you end up left. If you go too far left, you end up right. So it's really a question of um, personal liberty or the state tells you what to do. Because one one goes through, like, if you go to the right, you know, those are the Mussolini's and the Hitler's of the world, right? You go through sort yeah. of that cult of personality, but you still end up, by the way, Nazism is called national socialism for a reason, right? National socialism. How'd the word socialism get in there if he's right of center? Because he was a dictator. But then you go through sort of the, the Stalin, the communist, you go left to center, you still end up with no freedom at the bottom of the circle. That's true. Either way, either way you get there. So you asked me about education. We've lost a generation or two because we've seeded education because what do we do? We say, mm -hmm. here, you teach my kid. And yep. my family growing up was very simple, which is I'm going to teach my children and you, the, the school, should augment that in, cer in terms of some of the basic disciplines. I mm. we used to refer to as reading, writing, and arithmetic. But right. now we find that arithmetic is racist. But oh, my, two plus two equals five. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that, but that's a different issue. Yeah. So yeah. it's really, and it goes back to the two-parent two income, right? I mean, now it's looked down upon. And again, look, um, if a married couple both want to work, let them work. And if the, if the wife or husband wants to work, let them work. This is not, you know, um, the stone ages where women have to stay home and raise the kids. But there's studies that abound that show that when one parent is home full time, the kids are better and well adjusted. So the whole conversation about two parents working is, I think, also worthy of more conversation. But getting back to it, you start with the seed. The seed is K to six. Mm -hmm. If you started now in, in college, college and academia is so far gone right yeah because those kids the people in college right now have already had 12 years of indoctrination right right um and i can tell you i know people whose children claim that they were in college and they got lower grades because of the um ideology or politics of their answers meaning they were conservative and the professors 
gave them lower grades. Now, is oh, that's that anecdotal? That's anecdotal. I don't have any proof of that, but I've certainly heard enough stories from parents who have relayed that to me over. Oh yeah, years. I mean, I've had friends not in college, but their their kids are in high school or middle school, and they're having teachers argue with them about things, and you know, questions will be right. will be worded in such a way like, you know, um, I don't know you know, because Republicans are racist, that means, you know, whatever. And I mean, it is so obviously twisted in a way to frame everyone else as being bad. And, and I think what's fascinating, you know, you talked about politics, like being a, a circle rather than a line, the spectrum of politics being a circle rather than a line. And when I watched the interview with Tucker Carlson and Jimmy Dore, I don't know if you got to see this. Jimmy Dore is a far left uh, uh, political pundit. Tucker Carlson is a is a far right, well, maybe not far right, is a right wing political pundit, right? They're very right and left, like very far apart. And they're agreeing on almost everything. They were talking, agreeing on almost everything. There was some disagreement about who was responsible but even Jimmy Dore was is like the government sucks. But so we really agree a lot more than we disagree, and yet there's all this rhetoric to make us hate each other. We have lost civil discourse. We have lost the ability. Look, I don't think that everyone needs to agree with me. Let's have a yeah. conversation. Let's have a respectful conversation in the public square and let's exchange ideas. I'm not here to try to change how you think, but if we can't exchange ideas, look, yeah. let, 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 I mean, we're going to go big for a second, right? Let's go big. So, and by the way, the one comment I did want to make is uh, my new, you know who my new favorite Republican is? Who? Bill Maher. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Because because while he is irreverent, which I like, he is clearly, um, you know, less say fair, you know, and, and most yeah. people would say he is left of center. And by the way, can we not use the word right wing? Because then mm. you're using their language. Just a point. Mm. But, oh, so I like Bill, that. OK. Right. But but Bill Maher is now espousing or saying things that are making the extreme uh, progressives in uh, on the left side of the spectrum uncomfortable because he's speaking truth and and it was okay when he was focusing on the you know donald trump or the republicans but mm -hmm. now that he's using the same sort of x-ray vision to look at what's going on with the social justice transformative warrior movement now it's not okay and much like jk rowling he will be either they're trying to cancel or marginalize him but let's go big for a second um the system is built on compromise it used to be in Washington that the Republicans and the Democrats might disagree on things, but once upon a time, the Prince of Darkness to the Republicans, Ted Kennedy, and the former head of the Ku Klux Klan, um, you know, uh, Jesse Helms, could get along on certain issues. On these things, they would disagree. On these things, they would get along. But they had a relationship across the aisle. Part of the problem now is Republicans are only talking to Republicans. Democrats yeah. are only talking to Democrats. We have no ability to reach off the reach across the aisle. So what do you do is you vilify people you don't know. And you vilify people you have no relationship with. Yep. On a system, don't forget, this was a system of checks and balances. Not only were, did the founders, and, and we can get back into the whole Articles of Confederation versus the Constitution, which was not 1776, but was 1787, another discussion, right? But when the uh, Constitution was was written in 1787 they created three branches of government there was supposed to be checks and balances not only between branches but within branches but that yeah. necessitates compromise you got to talk to people you have to talk across the aisle when you we're hermetically sealed the social justice warrior movement doesn't want anyone doesn't want us talking to them because we might find people those some of those useful idiots who actually we can have a dialogue with keep them the, What's the expression? Divide and conquer. Keep yep. the sides divided. It's much easier, by the way. Rules for radicals. Keep the sides divided. It's yep. much easier to control and it's much easier to rule when when you're divided into little yep. microcosms. Well, you're 
you know, white and you're black and you're Jewish and you're Muslim and you're Christian and you're, let's divide everybody. Keep the, we become a tower of Babel. It's much easier for them to rule over us. And that's what's going it's, on. It is so true. It is so, so true. And that's, I think if I could, if I could bestow any wisdom on the whole world or everyone in the United States, it would be that, you know, stop seeing everyone else as your enemy. Um, you know, somebody who's a Democrat, uh, we may disagree on policy, but we may, you know, want the same thing for our kids or grandkids or, you know, whatever. And, and they're not stupid. They're not, you know, most people, right. They're just going along to get along and they don't realize that they might be hurting somebody or, you know, and so I think that, you know, trying not to see everyone as the enemy or everyone as nefarious. Now, when we're talking about government officials, that's another thing. When we're talking about elected officials who know better, who have the information and are very clearly lying to the American people or telling fibs, you, I hold those people to a different standard. And I'm going to and I'm going to look at them differently if they're saying things that are untrue. But the average American who just sees headlines or some nonsense while they're scrolling through Facebook and, and then is ill-informed, I'm not going to have the same upset against them. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. But did I hear you correctly? Did you just say that politicians actually lie? I'm <laughs> Oh my no, God, say, say it isn't so. You mean, you mean like when President Obama was pushing Obamacare and he said, well, if you like your health care plan, you can keep you it. You to keep and it. Lie, no. right? But no one calls them out on this. Yes. Look, there's, there's two There's two issues. The first issue that no one wants to talk about, you you, you heard the, the term deep state. Do you know what the deep yeah. state really is? What's the deep state? It's like I didn't mean, the... Oh, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I apologize. No, that's no, that's a good question. I guess I've never when I hear people say deep state, what I think they mean is um, the unelected bureaucrats who are really in charge of the rules and procedures. You are a million percent correct. So what we're really talking about is not the deep state, which sounds ominous. You're talking about the administrative state. You're talking about yes. the, the behemoth yeah. of the federal government of unelected officials who, regardless of who's the political uh, elected, politically elected leaders are, they are the constant. They, and by yes. the way, they're unionized. That was the problem dur during FDR. They weren't supposed to be unionized. Private companies could have unions, but when they, but when the government, right, SEIU, right, um, service employees, something union, um, and what's the government, government, GEICO, government employee insurance company, right, all that stuff, right? The administrative state is the deep state. That's what people don't understand. So Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch wrote a book called The Republic, if you can keep it. And it, while it is not a page turner, it is a brilliant read. And I would recommend all your listeners, if you ha don't have that book, go buy it. And in one all section, right. he goes through the problem with the administrative state. And that's really, I mean, two thirds of, of the budget go through two things, Social Security and Medicare. So you can reform all this other stuff, but unless you reform that and unless you reform the administrative state, right, because we go into the executive orders and things like that, you, you can't reform government. It's not possible. The, the yeah. beast is too big and all it wants to do is feed itself. And yes. anything that gets in the way of that now becomes the enemy. And we can then talk, obviously, well, about the politicization of some of those um, institutions, whether it's the FBI or DOJ. CIA, th things like that. But, you know, that's a different conversation. But the, at the end of the day, the, the issue is the administrative state. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether that's Republicans, you know, Donald Trump went, went to clean the swamp, right? He was he yeah. was going to clean the swamp, right? The problem is, is that he didn't clean the swamp. He built a nice building on a swamp and therefore the <laughs> building was unstable. Right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. How do you clean? You can't clean. You can't fire them. How can well, you, this you can't fire the bureaucrats and the bureaucrats? I mean, can. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. Congress has abdicated its authority. They were supposed to make the laws, but they don't make yes. the laws or, or they make these laws that are 5,000 pages that people sign that they don't read. 
And then they say to the, and then they give it to the bureaucrats or the executive, you know, signs it. And then they give it to these unelected bureaucrats to implement. Yep. And they don't necessarily have budgets attached. No. Uh, you know, a, a course. It's not like, oh, here's a law and here's how you're going to do it. There's not often not funding attached money to it's like a blank check to whatever administrative state or whatever administrative agency just got some new way to control things as a kickback for a campaign contribution almost always well, almost well, always well, well look i'm not against lobbying right lobbying is part of any government right it's a, by the and the term lobby in this country was developed at the at the not the hay adams the willard right because they used to i want to say i forget which president it was but they would they would try to um access i'm trying to remember president it wasn't i have to go back in my memory but that's where it comes from the willard and the round robin bar uh because they used to wait in the lobby for him right that's where the lobbies come from but every government okay. has that right um China, it's called fragrant grease. Um, in in Iran, it's called pish gas. It, it's a lubricant to the system. That's what mm -hmm. it is, right? But but the problem is not that. The prop because everyone is going to advocate for what for their own interest. I mean, That's I advocate for things. Right, you're supposed to. You're supposed to be. By the way, that goes back to the founding, right? When we were founded in this country, we, they thought there was this new man that walked the earth, called an American, and if all you did was, you know let them be free, that they would um, put government or country before themselves. 11 years later, they realized that was not correct, that people are going to pursue their own self-interest, hopefully an enlightened self-interest first, right? And that's why you have to yeah. compromise. If you can't, if you don't talk to people, you can't compromise. And if the other yeah. side is silencing us using political correctness, they keep us divided and therefore we're at each other's throats. That's the deal. Yes, yes, we, we've got to do something different. All right, Robert, what we've come around the hour. So what what have I missed? What what is a burning desire? What do we need to make sure we cover today? Oh, that's a pretty good question. I think I think we've oh. covered a lot. I think we really you know need what? to. I think I think, though, the one thing we touched on education, the, the one thing that's so important in education is school choice. Oh, yes. Because at the end of the day, every child has a right to learn. You know, there was this whole movement about right to work, which I supported and still support. But what about a children's right to learn? Or if I'm a minority that's the, or not a minority that's trapped in the inner city, what do I want? I want my children to start off better than I than I did. The pathway to escape the cycle of poverty is only one thing. It's education. So am I going to be forced to send my child to a failing school, and by the way, let's call them what they are. They're not public schools, they're government funded schools. So, you know, what's in a name, right? Well, they're public schools, so who wouldn't support public schools? That's crap. They're government funded schools that the public goes to, but they're not public schools, right? So we yep. need competition within the educational system. We need to get away from tenure or at least lessen its iron grip on things. We need to give parents the choice to send their children to the school of their choice. That's what we haven't touched on. That's the seed of all of all of this. If you want to take yeah. back your society, it starts with and it probably ends with education. Education. I like it. I like that. That you know what? That's a really good place to to put a pin in it, Robert. I'm just going to share with everybody, you know, go check out Robert. You, you we've got the ASIC website uh, that you guys can go check out, learn more, see how get in contact. Uh, you can donate, you can contribute to spreading conservative values. You know, the big thing we say, self-governance, self-governance, self-governance. And if you can't go, you know, host a constitutional live class or run for office, you can financially support the people who are. So that's my pitch for donating here. Uh, we got Mr. Robert on Rumble. Uh, we're, you know, <clears throat> I'm seeing a bunch of footage going up now. Uh, you're getting all the stuff on Twitter. You've got some things on Twitter. You've got Instagram going. You're on all the social medias. Everybody can check him out at Robert Chernin 
C H E R N I N on all the socials, the Twitters. Check out ASIC. Uh, what else? Where else can they find you? Is there anything else you want to give a shout out to the audience and uh, to get in touch with you or pose pose a question for them to answer in the comments? Uh, well, first of all, anyone who wants to email me, I can be reached at Robert C at ASIC Fund, A C E K F U N D dot O R G. Email me if you have any questions. But we have other websites up. Defend the Vulnerable is another one of our websites. Coalition for America, the number four America. We're trying to attack this on a lot of on a lot of different levels. This is this is the vanguard of a populist movement to from outside government to within. This is not about electing government officials. There's a place for that, and that's important. I'm not I'm not discounting that. But this is about um, a movement. This is about the populism. This is about the middle class, and this is about reestablishing those really core constitutional principles, very simple, individual liberties as spelled out in the Bill of Rights, the code of personal responsibility of which how you live your life and taking care of your neighbor, not because the government tells you you have to, but because you want to. Mm, I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being with us here today on Generally Irritable. Uh, we're going to go out with the with the theme song, and uh, and we'll catch you on the other side. Bye, everybody. See you, Erica. Thank you. Bye.